I pray to God that that there will be a, a spirit of patriotic revival take place in us. We need spiritual revival more than anything. But I honestly believe that we need a revival of patriotism in our country as well. Pray for your country. That's why I said a moment ago, it's easy for me to get so cynical. Pray for me. Would you do that? What a week we've had. It's just been tremendous. Every single night, the way God has used His servant. And uh, my granny used to say, I'm led to believe that that same thing is going to happen tonight. Would you welcome our evangelist this evening, Brother Charles Tooney Cash. Tooney, come, brother. All right. I was waiting for Beth to sing. I thought she was singing tonight. All right. Sure. Good. Mm-hmm. Isn't that good? Amen. Bless you, Beth. Bless you. It takes courage to make a testimony like that or share something like that. Appreciate that tonight. God bless you. I had a good crowd on Wednesday evening. Happy that you are here in the service. I hope that uh, you have received a blessing. If you have enjoyed trying to listen as much as I've enjoyed trying to preach, I feel like we've all had a good time. Amen. Amen. I've had a good time this week and I've just, I felt at home. Amen. And I've just had a good time and the Lord has been with us every service and he's going to be with us tonight. Amen. Already is. And Bob, I appreciate that and Ronnie, I appreciate that. Two good numbers there. I love America. I'm not happy about some of the things that's going on in this country, but I still believe it's the greatest country that's ever been. It has been and was at one time a country in which and through which God could show to the world what he could do with a nation that loved him and were faithful and committed unto him. And it's still true, Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness exhorteth a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. God help us to restore those old 
ancient landmarks that our forefathers established. You know, uh, this country was built, built upon biblical principles. Some people don't believe that. Some would maybe think we got our uh, branches of government from France or England, but you know, they come out of the word of God. Isaiah 33, 22, he's our lawgiver. That's the legislative branch. He's our judge. That's your judicial branch. He's our king. That's executive branch. Right out of the word of God. You didn't know that, did you? I mean, we just right there in the Word of God. So uh, this nation was founded upon biblical principles and I believe by godly men who love the Lord. And so God help us to get back to those days. Amen? To get back to those days. Ronald Reagan once said, when we forget we're one nation under God, then we will become a nation gone under. God help us to remember that. All right? Let's make our little confession. Let's stand tonight. You look like you're healthy and energetic. Let's stand and make our confession. Here we go. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Tonight I'll be taught the word of God. I will never be the same. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I will never be the same. Never, never, never. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Somehow, I just can't get away from this message for this evening. And normally when it's like that, the Lord surely wants it. Amen. And Matthew chapter 7. God has a way and ways of letting you know and giving you peace about things. And uh, many times I go to church. I'm, I'm prepared to preach. But sometimes I don't know which one. But something will happen. Something will be said. Somebody pray a prayer, somebody sing a song, somebody give a testimony, and the Lord said, that's it. That's the one. And so tonight, I believe this is in the Lord's sovereignty and providence and will. Matthew chapter 7, verses 12 to 14. One of the three chapters covering our Lord's great message, there's something about Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And uh, perhaps the greatest sermon preached by the greatest preacher, Jesus himself. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. That's reading just three verses from this the seventh chapter of Matthew's gospel. I want us to think together tonight upon this subject, if we may. The greatest thing in all this world. The greatest thing in all this world. I want to start of the game show where the game show host ask a particular question to a group of young children. But before he asked the question, he made this statement, Brother Ron. He said, for the very first one of you young people that can answer this question that I'm about to ask each of you, or about to ask you, in 10 seconds or less, I'm going to give that young person a brand new bicycle. Can you imagine the eyes of those youth as they lit up when they heard the term? Brand new bicycle. He said, now here's the question, don't miss it. He said, what you to believe is the greatest thing in all this world? And I mean, the little boy raised his hand. The game show host said, well, son, I assume you must have the answer. Well, I said, sure, sure. That's not difficult at all. I uh, said, the game show host, would you mind sharing with the other ones in the group what you believe to be the greatest thing in all this world? The little boy said, well, sir, I'll be glad to. He said, well, sir, you know the greatest thing in all of this world is God's Salvation. God's 
salvation. Well, as you can imagine, this day and time, the most game show, oh, he was somewhat stunned. He, he probably anticipated the little boy said, well, sir, the greatest thing in all this world must be a nuclear energy or maybe something pertaining to our space program or maybe some new discovery in the field of technology. But no, he said, sir, the greatest thing in all of this world is God's salvation. Well, at the game show host, got his uh, composer somewhat back together and thought it through. He said, you know, son, I suspect that you're absolutely correct that the greatest thing in all of this world is God's salvation. You know, Brother Ronnie, I too believe that to that that the greatest thing in all of this world is God's salvation. I'm talking about salvation so great that he take a sinner out of the merry pits of sin, set his feet upon a solid rock, and establish his going. I'm talking about salvation so great, take a sinner out of the darkness of sin, and put him in the light toward heaven. I'm talking about salvation so great, take the phallus sinner, save him by God's grace, head him toward glory. I'm speaking about great Salvation, But you know, in spite of all the greatness of the salvation we have in through and by the person of Jesus Christ, sad is the truth that still comes out in our text in verse 13 where the writer writes, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in there and, and that is a tragedy. Now, if salvation is the greatest thing in all this world, which I'm convinced from old heart and mind that it is, then there must be some reasons why this is so. There must be some characteristics about this salvation that makes it absolutely without doubt and reservation the greatest thing in all this world. So I just want to share with you somewhat briefly tonight five or six little simple reasons, simple reasons, why I believe that salvation is the greatest thing in all this world. First of all, I believe salvation is the greatest thing in all this world. First of all, because God himself thought it. God thought it. And before God created this vast universe, and before God placed the sun and the moon and the stars, platonic bodies and the solar system and the Milky Way and all else, the prospects of sin entered the heart and mind of God uh, ever before he created this vast universe. And uh, so he sent his son Jesus to go to the cross and take our place, experience our hell, pay our sin debt, that we could be saved and go to heaven. But, but ever before God created all of this that we have here, the need for this great salvation enter the heart and mind of Almighty God. Listen to what Paul writes over in Ephesians 1, 4. According as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. At least in Revelation, author of Revelation 13, 8, writing about the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. Yes, and before God created all of this that we have here, the need for this great salvation enter the heart and mind of of Almighty God. He could see that man was going to fall. He could see that man was going to sin. So he made a provision when he did that he could be taken care of. Amen? So God is a great God. And salvation is the greatest thing in all this world because God himself thought it. You know we have a great God. We preach about him. We teach about him. We sing about him. We talk about him. We think about him. We try to figure out in and with our little finite minds what God's really like. But we only touch the fringes of God's greatness. Even though George Beverly Shea, the fellow that worked for Billy Graham for over 60 years, he and Cliff Bauer and Billy Graham, uh, never has there been a trio like that. Probably there will be one after that. 60 plus years together. Now there was Moody and Tori and Sankey, but my, my Moody died at 62. Billy Graham's what now, about 96 or 7? And... and, and uh, uh, oh, uh, George Beverly Shea died the other day. It's 104 years of age. Think of all the hundreds and thousands of times. Was it 90 sometimes in that great meeting went for weeks in New York that he sang the, uh, the song How Great They Are? And God only knows how many hundreds and thousands of times he sang it all together. But even though he, he probably sang it as, as, as great as anyone ever sang it, he still only touched the fringes of God's greatness. We have a great God. Who else could place a sun out yonder some 93 million miles away from this earth, yet the rays from that sun have the ability to bless you in summertime without copper tone. Who else could do that but a God with sense that we have? Who else could place a moon out yonder some 240,000 miles away from this earth, but yet have the power to govern the tides of the great ocean? Who else could create a world 79% water, 21% land. No one of the psalmist said in Psalm 8, when I consider the heavens, uh, the works that I finger, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visit him? We have a great God. If you think that's something, consider that pump there inside your chest area called your heart that beats about uh, 4,300. 
120 times per hour, about 103 to 104,000 times a day, about 40 million times a year, and does that maybe 60, 70, 80, 90, maybe 100 plus years. Who else could place something inside the chest of an individual like that but a God such as we have? Now I say, are you listening? I say salvation is the greatest thing in all this world. First of all, because God himself thought it. But secondly, salvation is the greatest thing in all this world because Jesus bought it. Amen? Remember what Peter uh, said or writes over in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19? For as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. That means there's not one sin to mark Christ's record. Not one charge to be brought against our Lord's account. He was God, divine, virgin, born, sinless, and Lamb of God, of whom John the Baptist said in John 1, 29, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And Paul writes over in Ephesians 2, verse 13, You who were once afar off have been made nigh or brought nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. Would you go with me for a few moments? Back yonder to that day, that awful day, when Jesus hung there on that cross between those two thieves. Awful in one sense, but great in another because he was doing it for every sinner. But remember how they had treated him, scoffed him, scorned him, abused him, plucked his beard, spat upon him, stripped him of his garments, put upon him a purple robe and a ring in his hand, a crown on his head, and said, Hail, King of the Jews! Then remember they took that old plaited crown of thorns and placed it upon his brow as they were getting ready to put him upon the cross and took a reed and smote that crown of thorns and opened up the fountain which the most precious blood had ever been shed began to flow down our Lord's face and Isaiah had prophesied hundreds and hundreds of years before his countenance was marred more than any other man. And I try to see our Lord hanging there on that cross that day and that zenith of the sun marring that blood to his face and body. But out from underneath the marred sections, Brother Ronnie, I see that precious and princely and pure and precious and royal blood streaming down our Lord's face and dropping from his chin and hitting his breast. And down over his breast it would go and down over his waist and down the upper parts of his legs and down the lower over his knees and down the lower parts of his legs and off yonder at the end of his toes at the foot of the cross. As one old great preacher used to say, when that blood hit the sand on the, below, beyond the, below the cross, it said to the sand, it is finished. And the sand carried it out to the grass and said, it's finished. And the grass took it on to the flowers and said, it's finished. And the flowers took it on out to the trees and said, it's finished. And the trees took it on up to the birds on the limbs and said, it's finished. And the birds from the limbs winged it on up to the clouds and said, it's finished. And the clouds carried it down through the corridors of glory and said, it's finished. Nothing in my hands I bring simply to thy cross. I cling. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And through the shedding of that precious and princely and pure and priceless and royal blood, Jesus was able to reach down into a merry pit of sin. We were all at it. Lift us up and set our feet upon a solid rock and establish our going. And that behooves me to ask you, who could have or would have done such a thing for you like that but Jesus? Speaking, Brother Ronnie, of how we've been lifted up out of a merry pit and our feet haven't been placed upon a solid rock and our ways haven't been established, reminds me of a story I heard one time about this fella that fell into this pit. And the story goes with Bob that several different type folk came by that pit to check out his condition. For example, said the subjective man walked by Walked over, looked at, down in the pit at the man, saw the pit, checked out the fit, uh, pit, analyzed the pit, fell to the pit, examined the pit, and he said, you know, this really feels like a pit, said the subjective man. So the objective man came by and saw the man in the pit, said, you know, it's only logical that someday, somehow, someplace, sometime, somewhere, somebody would fall into a pit just like this one. Said the uh, Pharisee came by, Looked in, saw the man, saw his Oh, man. <laughs> I, oh, I know about men like you, man, falling in a pit like this. I, I thank God I'm not like other men are, said the Pharisee. 
said the Christian scientist walked by, looked in, saw the men, saw his condition, said, sir, no problem. Said, said all you need to remember is that, that, that your pit is just a state of mind. That's all just a state of mind. <laughs> said, said the mathematician walked by. Well, he tried to calculate the odds that anyone would ever fall into a pit like that. So the newspaper men came by, looked in, saw the men, saw it, said, hey men, when you get out of that pit, you give me a call because I want to do an exclusive story about you having fallen in this awful pit. Said Confucius, the wise men passed by and he said, if you'd have followed my teaching, sir, you'd never fall in this pit to begin with. So the old Buddha walked by, looked in, and said, man, you're pissed just in your mind, just simply in your mind. Said the, sci- the, the scientist came by and he tried to figure out the amount of pressure or a pound per square inch that it'd take to get that man up out of the pit. So the evolutionists came by, looked in, saw the men, saw his and said, oh man, I know why you fell in that pit. You fell in that pit so you wouldn't ever again be able to produce any genetic mutated pit falling off spring. That's exactly why you fell in that pit. Said the IRS man walked by, walked over, looked in, saw the men, saw his and said, sir, did you pay taxes on this pit? I just sent some of those awful things in today. And uh, quarterly, oh, God help. But, 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 but <laughs> the county inspector walked by, looked in, said, Sir, did you have a permit to dig a pit like this? Said the royal professor came by. Well, he just simply gave a lecture on the elementary principles of a pit. Said so the preacher came by, looked in, saw the men, saw his condition, got, got out pad and pencil, said, I, you know, I can see three simple things about this pit, and got him a three-point outline and left a man in the pit. Isn't that something? <laughs> said the evasive man came by, he just avoided the pit altogether. Said so the self-pitying man came by, looked in, saw the men, oh, man, oh, how awful, how terrible, what an unbelievable, awful pit. But if you think that one's bad, sir, you want to see the one I fell into one time, said the self-pitying man. Said the charismatic fellow walked by with his head up high and his shoulders laid back, walked over, looked down in at the fellow, said, Sir, no problem at all. No problem at all. Said, All you need to do is just confess you're not in a pit. I believe that'll take care of you, said the charismatic fellow. Said the pessimist walked by, looked in, saw the fellow, said, Hmm, there, there, could, there could be better pits. Said the optimist walked by, looked in, and said, There could be worse pits. But after all of these passed by, the man in the pit said, You know a man named Jesus walked by. He walked over, looked down in upon me through those loving and compassionate yet piercing eyes. And then he got down into the pit with me and identified with my need, then lifted me up out of the pit and set my feet upon a solid rock and established my going. Wasn't that exactly what Jesus did for all of us who've experienced his grace? Salvation's the greatest thing in all the world. Why God thought it. Why Jesus bought it. Why the Holy Spirit wrought it. Did you know you can't be saved apart from the divine working power of the Holy Spirit? 1 Corinthians 12, 3, Paul writes, you can't even confess Jesus as Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. In 1 Corinthians 2, 14, the natural man, the lost man, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. As old Dr. Van Chandler would say about that, you just as well talk nuclear physics to a wooden Indian in front of a cigar store then try to discuss the spiritual truth of God's word to a man whose heart and mind has never been illuminated by the power of God to comprehend spiritual truth. It's like casting a holy thing before dogs and pearl before swine. As our Lord said, like trying to catch a sunbeam with a fish hook or trying to describe a sunset to a blind man, sing songs to a dead man. He cannot understand that God the Holy Spirit, first of all, operates upon his heart and mind, illuminates his heart and mind to comprehend spiritual truth. Yeah. Amen? Amen? See, when you were born in this world, you had two parents, father and mother. And when you got saved, there's two parents. The Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, 3, just quote, you can't confess Jesus the Lord, but the Holy Ghost. And 1 Peter 1, 23, being born not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, the Word of God which lives the Bible forever. Don't ever forget, it's the Word of God that the Spirit of God uses to do His work of conviction in the heart of the unrepentant sinner. You can't be saved apart from the divine working power of the Holy Spirit. It's not what you can do first, what he's already done, not your faith first, but his faithfulness. Amen? 
So, salvation is the greatest thing in all the world. Why God thought it? Why Jesus bought it? Why the Holy Spirit wrought it? Why the Bible taught it? Yeah. The Bible taught it. All through this blessed book, we see a picture of Jesus. You say, oh, brother, I tell you what, I, I, I sure love to read the New Testament because it talks about Jesus. <laughs> well, if you hadn't seen the Old Testament, Testament, you missed a blessing. He's just not the theme of the book. He's the theme of each individual book. In Genesis, he's a promised seed. In Exodus, he's a Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's a scapegoat. In Numbers, a brazen serpent. In Deuteronomy, our Lord's a great lawgiver. In Joshua, he's prophet, priest, and king. In Judges, he's a judge of the universe. In Ruth, he's a kinsman redeemer. In Samuel, he's the anointer of the kings. In Kings, he's king of kings and lord of lords. In Chronicles, he's a great historian. In Ezra, he's rebuilt the temple. In Nehemiah, he's rebuilt the wall. In Esther, he's the savior of the Jews. In Job, he's that friend that's taken closer than a brother. In Psalms, he's the song of the ages. In Proverbs, he's the truth. In Ecclesiastes, he's a great preacher. In Song of Solomon, he's a wonderful lover. In Isaiah, he's a wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, the prince of peace. In Jeremiah, he's a weeping prophet. In Lamentations, he's a street preacher. In Ezekiel, he's a rebuilder of God's temple. In Daniel, he's that stone cut out with that hands will come and break the peace of the kingdom of this world. So the kingdom of his knowledge shall cover the face of the earth as the waters cover the sea. In Hosea, he's a spurned but forgiven lover. In the minor parts of one coming in Bethlehem of Judah. In Matthew, he's king of kings. In Mark, the servant, servant. Luke, the son of man. John, the son of God. In Acts, he's a pair of the church. In Romans, he's the dynamite of the gospel. In Corinthians, he's restore the old carnal nature. In Galatians, he's a rent veil. In Ephesians, a heavenly one. In Philippians, he is our sufficiency. In Colossians, a great coming shadow. Thessalonians, a great coming savior. Timothy, a great appearing God. In Titus, he's a blessed hope. In Philemon, he's forgiver of all the wayward slaves. In Hebrews, he's the best of all. In James, the fulfiller of all the law. In, in Peter, he's the rock of our salvation. In Jude, he's the one that uh, uh, and, uh, keeps us from falling. In John, he's our, in John, he's our assurance. In June, he's the one that keeps us from falling. Revelation, one coming on a white horse will set up a kingdom which Christ will rule and reign. Where'er the sun, his successive journeys run, his kingdom shall run from shore to shore. The moon shall wax and wait no more. I say if you want to read about Jesus, you turn about anywhere. But for many years, since I was a young boy, Bob, as a young junior intermediate boy at the Old Grove Baptist Church, I memorized the Roman road to salvation. Now, there's many verses you use, and when dealing with a sinner, you may not even choose to follow the Roman road, but I'm just saying I've, I've practiced it for years. And uh, if I was dealing with you tonight here at the altar as a lost person or out in your home, I'd try to tell you three or four things. I'd say, sir or ma'am, there's three or four things you need to understand. One is that you are a sinner. Not because I say you are, but the Word of God establishes that. Uh, Romans 3.10, as it's written, there's none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now listen, you're not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you're a sinner. Uh, Ephesians 2, 3 says, For by nature we're all the children of wrath. Therefore you don't have to teach your children to steal, have to teach them not to steal. Don't have to teach them to lie, have to teach them not to lie. Why? For by nature we're all the children of wrath. And you'll not get anybody saved, you get them lost. But uh, when they once admit they're lost and they see the need for being saved, the need called for faith, faith come by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But you'll not get a person saved, you get them lost. And it's not a matter of looking down your noses at them, giving them the impression, big eye, little you, hold it the now type attitude. The only difference between the saint and the sinner is the Savior. He's the one who makes the difference, you see. And so you get them lost and you tell them, secondly, there's an awful price on sin. And Romans 5, 12 says, for, for, As by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So then death is passed of all men, and that all have sin. And Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you get, a, you get that person who admits he's a sinner to see there's an awful price on sin, which is death and hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. It's never ending, known as the second death. Then you tell them the grandest thing of all, Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Perhaps the four sweetest words in all the Bible are Christ died for us. Then you tell them how it can be saved. Romans 10, 9, 10, and 13. That thou shalt confess with thy mouth, O Lord Jesus, believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believe the righteous, with the mouth confession is made 
into salvation. For whosoever, I'm glad you put it that way, Brother Ryan, because there used to be another Charles Cash on my route, one of my old routes years ago, and we get our mail all mixed up. But thank God when he said whosoever, that included everyone. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You say, well, Brother Tunia, I, I, I don't know if I've been elected. Are you running? If you're going to get elected, you've got to get in the campaign run, Right? And if you're in a campaign run, honey, I can tell you one thing. I know, I know you got two votes. God voted for you, and the devil voted against you. And that leaves the side of vote up you. That makes a whosoever will, let him come and drink of the water of life for you. That's God's proposition. Whosoever will, let him come. But the Bible has taught this great salvation. Why is it so great? Why is it the greatest thing in all the world? God thought it. Jesus bought it. Holy Spirit wrote it. The Bible taught it. The devil fought it. From the very beginning when the announcement about the birth of Jesus came. Remember Harry tried to get rid of the, all the male children. Wanted to get rid of Jesus. Just like the devil tried to get rid of Moses, a type of liver back in the Old Testament. And the effort of the devil failed. They, Jesus' family fled down into Egypt. Then remember the 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness after which the devil came and tempted uh, uh, the Lord in those three years walked tempted in lust of flesh, lust of eyes, and pride of life. In all three instances, we hear our Lord saying, it is written, it is written, it is written. And uh, again, the effort of the devil failed. And uh, uh, remember, they placed him upon that old rugged cross. And uh, some came by, did they not, and wagged their heads like dogs. <sighs> If you've been a son of God, in other words, why don't you come down from the cross? And one of the thieves said, and, 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 yeah, why don't you save yourself and save us? The devil knew if he could get him to come down, he'd stop redemption's plan. But thank God for that blessed old hymn. He didn't come down. Oh, no. He didn't come down. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. And then after a while, when he'd received all of God's fury and wrath and judgment upon sin. He lifted his head toward heaven and uttered perhaps the greatest single word ever uttered through the lips of our Lord. Three words in the King James Version of the Bible, third person singular, present tense, it is finished. But one big long word in the Greek, tetelesta, meaning it is finished. And he gave up The ghost. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus came, got the body, prepared it for burial, and put it in the borrowed tomb. And the stone was rolled up in the sealed place of one of the guard. A guard stood, stood by to make sure no one would steal away the body of the Lord. Can you imagine about this time? Now listen to me. Can you imagine about this time that old preacher man death and the devil begin to say, we got him. We got him. Son of God, Savior of the world, King of kings, Lord of lords. <laughs> we got him. We got him. And we're going to make sure that no one steals away his body. But see, they were so wrong, Bob. You couldn't lock God up in a cube-shaped tomb and keep him there. No. Oh. One of my evangelist buddies, Phil Hoskins, a good friend of mine, sent me a poem several years ago, and, and uh, I, I don't know where it originated. I'm glad somebody wrote it, and all good things come from God. But uh, it's about old Father Time and pale King Death, and it fits in pretty good right here. If you pray for me, I try to share it with you. It's, it's fairly lengthy, so you pray for me, would you? It goes like this. Father Time met pale King Death sitting by the tomb. Hello, old friend. I guess you're here to seal somebody's doom. You might say that sly death replied. A smile lit up his face. For inside lies that Jesus man who said he'd say the race. And you, Time, why do you pass this way? Don't you have other things to do? Oh, said time, I just come each day and draw the veil and let the morning through. 
A new death? Why are you watching just one grave with all of your vast domain? Looks like you'd be out rambling around smiting folk with pain. Well, said old death, this one's kind of special. He challenged me, they say. Said he's going to lie here just three days and then stare and walk away. Now, said old death, I'm the conqueror, you know. They don't talk up to me. For when I step in to cut them down, it's for eternity. I can sure testify to that, said Father Tam. I ain't seen one kick off the dust since you've been in your prime. Well, said old time, I got other things to do. I must be on my way. But I'll see you when I come again to make another day. So whispered time went up the hill and bid the sun to rise and left death standing by the tomb a looking strong and wise. The next day time passed by again. How are things he queried? Kind of quiet, death replied. I'm beginning to feel weary. Oh, said O death, I'll not be here when you pass by this time tomorrow, for I'm anxious to be on my way to spread some grief and sorrow. Now, Father Time was quite surprised when he returned to see death are quivering on the ground in frightful agony. His eyes were set, his throat was marked, his clothes in disarray. It wasn't difficult to see that death had had his day. What happened, death? asked Father Time. I never seen you look so bad. I, I, I've never seen you shake this way before. Looks so scared and sad. Death pulled himself up on a rock and looking sick and humble, bowed his head and wrung his hands and time could hear him mumble. Was sitting here before the dawn about to take my stroll when all at once this whole wide world began to reel and roll. That rolling stone jumped off the tomb and skipped on down the hill and everything grew dark and quiet. It seemed the earth stood still. I saw him standing in the door. He didn't move nor speak. Just looked at me. And all at once I felt so tired and weak. He came and got a hold of me, threw me to the ground, put his foot here on my neck and took my keys and crown. Two angels came and talked with him. They glistened as the sun. I heard him say, work's all finished now. Redemption's plan is done. As they passed by the garden gate, I heard them say just then, say, he said to free the captives and given gifts to men. Now, Father, time and death met once again off yonder by the gate. Said, old time, how are you, old friend? I've been wondering about your fate. Said, old death, I'm just a lowly servant now with little time to roam. I just push open this old gate and help the saints get home. Harried couldn't kill him. Death wouldn't destroy him. The grave couldn't hold him. The devil couldn't seduce him. Even demons obeyed him. And Brother Ronnie, the Revelation author tells me <clears throat> that tonight he Still has the keys to both death and hell. Salvation is the greatest thing in all this world. Why God thought it? Why Jesus bought it? Why the Holy Spirit wrote it? Why the Bible taught it? Why the devil fought it? But hallelujah to the Lamb. Over 50 years ago, I caught it. <laughs> or he caught me. How you want to get theoretically correct? I heard, the, uh, I heard the word of God preached and the Holy Spirit convicted me of my sin. I realized I was a lost, hell-bound sinner and repented of my sin by faith received Christ and he saved me and changed my destination from hell to heaven just like that. And I know tonight, not just by word of lip, but by experience. The salvation is the greatest thing in all this world. Do you know him tonight in whom to know is life everlastingly, eternal? I didn't ask you if you know about him because I know about George Washington and John Adams and Thomas Jefferson and Ben Franklin and Moreau and Harrison and, and uh, Grant and Lincoln. and I, I, I know about a lot of them old historical figures, but I didn't know him personally. Paul writes in Philippians 3.10 that I might know him. 
That's a pure personal experience. And the power of his resurrection, that's a powerful experience. Uh, be making, uh, you know, and the fellowship of his suffering. Be made conformable into his death. Do you know him tonight? If not, you can come and give your hand to the preacher and your heart to Jesus. And be saved right here in the service. But if you already know him, then I'd be interested in asking you this. Are you faithfully serving him? Because Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 2 that it's required of all stewards. Not, not suggested. Now it's required of all stewards to be found faithful. Are you faithful to God? Are you really faithful to God? Are you really faithful to God? To church, the word, prayer, giving, witnessing. Are you really faithful? If not, maybe you need to come tonight saying, Lord, if, not that we could ever repay him. Don't mistake me. We could never repay him. But Lord, if you can go to the cross, and take my place, experience my hell, pay my sin debt, purchase my free passport to heaven, and put your hands to the cross for me, sure the least I can do for you is put my hands to the plow and not look back and be faithful. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Every head bowed, every eye closed. How many of you say, Brother Tony, thank God I know in whom I have believed. Now persuade he God is able to keep that which I've committed him against that day. I know I'm saved for sure forever. Would you raise your hand tonight? Would you raise your hand tonight? Would you lift your hand? God bless you. That seemed to be practically everybody. Now you may put them down. If someone tonight you couldn't lift your hand just then. You don't know if you died today or if Jesus come. You don't know you go to heaven, but right now you lift your hand and say, pray for me. Would you do that? One anywhere? Well, I don't see any hands, but that doesn't mean you're not here. If you're here, and probably there are some in a crowd this side, probably are some. So you come and give your heart to Jesus if you're lost. But Christian, may I say this to you? I mean, you say, Brother Tooney, I know I'm saved, but Brother Tooney, I just need to be more committed and more faithful to my Lord. Would you lift your hand? Would you do that? God bless you and you and you and you and you and you. Yes, and you, and you, yes, God bless, and you, yes, yes, and you, yes, yes, yes. Not that I could ever repay him, Brother Tooney, but just because of what he's done for me out of loving, faithful appreciation, I just out of loving appreciation, I need to express my faithfulness. Would you lift your hand and say, yes, pray for me. God bless you, I see that hand. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? My Heavenly Father, I thank you tonight for the service now. And I pray if there be anybody here that's lost, Lord, would you save them for Jesus' sake. For those who are here, but they're saved, but maybe they're just not as faithful as they ought to be. And some evidently have indicated that tonight to be true in their lives. And I pray that you'll help them come publicly. Every disciple, Lord, you ever call, you call publicly. There's something about us making our commitments and decisions publicly, meaningful to us, meaningful to you, strike against the devil, strike to our side of the ledger. Says to the world about us, I don't care for the world to know I want my life to count for Jesus. So Lord, would you in a special way tonight help people to come publicly making those commitments, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me please, Brother Ronnie, you come and uh, do we have someone to play or are we just going to Yes, we do have someone to play. You come, honey, just pick a hymn of invitation. Whatever you pick will be fine. And as you play, uh, then those who've lifted your hand, if you meant business, let's do business. If you love him, let's obey him. All right, would you do that? As she plays, Brother Ronnie's here. If you lift your hand and say, I need to be more faithful, you come right now, would you? Would you come right now? Who'll be first? Who'll be first? We're waiting. We're waiting on you. You lifted your hand. You need to be more faithful. Come on right now, would you? Okay. Someone else now. Someone else. That's right. That's right. Come on, would you? Come on.
as Patsy continues to play. If you feel a need to come tonight, please do that. Come. If God speaks to you, it will be absolutely the best decision you ever make. Anyone else? If I was unsaved tonight, the message has been so clear. I really wouldn't want to leave. I wouldn't. I'm not trying to scare you. If I thought I could scare you, I would. But the message has been so clear. The fact that God loves us so much that He sent His Son to die for us. And there is salvation in Him. If you'd like to talk with me at the end of the service or Tooney, uh, I'm sure that'll be just fine. Well, it's been a great week. You know what? You know, we applaud sometimes, and, and that's good because we appreciate, you know, maybe what people do or something. But, uh, you know, I think a lot of times we just need to give the Lord a good hand clap and just say thank you, Lord. Don't you? It has been a great week. Every single night decisions were made, and uh, I praise God for that. And uh, uh, God is all about timing. And uh, I don't think the timing for our church could have been any better for this meeting, and it's, uh, it's been wonderful. Tooney will be back out in just a second. He'll be out in the vestibule area back there. And uh, if you appreciate his stand for the Word of God and... Uh, his boldness, uh, you you let him know about that and pray for him. He's got so much on him, a very busy schedule, and then the only the things that his family's dealing with as well. So I know he'll appreciate that. Anyone with a word or anything before we're dismissed? Yes. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, that's great, Carrie. God bless you. And, and I love those testimonies. Because see, that just gives all honor, praise, and glory to Christ. Anyone else? All right. Amen. God bless you, Beth. We're glad to have you home. Don't forget tomorrow evening, 6 o'clock. Be here and uh, we'll eat and fellowship together and then uh, Brother Han will come and speak to us. Many of you have come every single night of this revival. Thank you for all that you have done and I really appreciate that. Let's bow and we're going to be dismissed in prayer.